All right, welcome everyone. I see lots of people pouring into the to the room here um, to listen to these fine authors speaking. And I am going to just give a few little housekeeping items. We have um, six authors reading for you tonight. And my name is Carson Tate with Bold Strokes Books. And I'm excited about you all being here for this bookathon. Make sure to, this is the last session for today. Make sure to join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time, Pamela Stewart. Chairman, chairperson of GLAD will be giving a keynote presentation and it will be fantastic. And then we have another full slate of events after that for Saturday and Sunday. Um, I'll be posting a flash sale in the chat roll just so you know. Um, we're running a sale on all these authors' books and um, we also have our August books. They're not on sale, but it's still July and the August books are available. Um, live in the store today. So <laughs> anyway, I am going to, without further ado, get started and I'm going to turn it over to Sanjin Karp, who is going to read from his new work, Quake City. And it's all yours. Thank you very much. It's a real treat to be here. Uh, so my name's Sanjin and my novel is available today from the Bold Strokes bookstore. It's called Quake City. Um, I lived in San Francisco for 10 years and all of the wonderful and horrifying experiences I had went into this book. It takes place all in one night and it's basically every shitty night out that you've ever had condensed into one. Uh, so I'll uh, read from chapter one and you can, you can uh, get a feel for the thing. I don't want to go to a party, says Tom. I arch an eyebrow at him skeptically. Yes, look at this. No human can withstand the eyebrow. I'm crueler than Cruella de Vil and more magnificent than Maleficent. Tom shrieks and withers under the shade my eyebrows throwing at him, begging me for mercy, apologizing through his tears for being so depressingly heterosexual and refusing to go to one teeny tiny party. Or at least he would be if he was looking at me. But he's still lying on my couch with his head on the armrest, browsing kinkbitches.com on his phone. I hold my eyebrow arched like that for a second in case he looks up and I can pretend I've just done it. Come on, Tom, look at me. Look at me. My face muscles start spasming. I drop the eyebrow and rub the side of my face, pretending it never happened. I don't know why I bother trying to have facial expressions for Tom. He even ignores the one I call the judgment of Meredith. Look at, see, it's all in the eyebrows and the lips. Before you even realize what's happened, I have become someone called Meredith. You don't know anything about Meredith but you know she's judging you. She's judging you for all your dumbass ideas and your weird music. I imagine Tom has just told me Grace Jones is a second-rate singer. Come the fuck on, who doesn't like Grace Jones? She's a goddess. Fucking Tom, wouldn't know sexy if it came in his face. Who does he think he is anyway? Fuck you, Tom, I shout. You think this is all about you, but it isn't, you know? It just isn't. Tom is so startled, he loses his grip on the phone and drops it on his nose. I'd laugh, but Meredith is still, still too angry with him. What do I do now, he says, giving me a sideways scowl. You know what you said, you son of a bitch. All I said was I didn't want to go to a party. Oh, right, the party. I put my angry face away for the time being, but the ghost of Meredith still haunts my eyebrows. Tom's all right looking, I guess, if you're into that kind of thing, though his hair is always too long. and His hands are too rough from climbing mountains or wrestling goats or whatever it is straight people do all day. Now he's trying to act like a party is such a huge deal. If he's going to crash on my couch and mooch my hospitality for a week, the least he can do is come with me. Tough, I say. You have to go. There's only one key, so you won't be able to get back in. So I won't go out. What if there's a fire? Then I'll die, he says. I don't even know what you're saying to me right now. Why are you going to be so freaking weird about it? I turn away from him to check myself in the mirror. Do these jeans make my ass look big? I can tell he's not looking, but he answers, massive. Never underestimate the power of the ass. I never has. have, he says. I turn to give him a view of it and flex one cheek after the other, doing an accent. Tom, look deep into my eye. I will hypnotize you with my sexy power. But he's not paying attention, so I do another voice. Oh, well, what's this? My stars, I appear to have dropped my handkerchief. I better bend over and pick it up before I get an attack of the vapors. I bend over in front of him and give him a face full of my magnificent ass. He looks at me and says, what kind of party is this anyway? 
It's a gay party. Ah, oh, he says, rolling his face into the sofa. What you mean is there's no chicks and I'm going to spend the whole time being leched on by queens. What am I supposed to do all night? Oh my God, it's like you have no idea how this even works. Listen up, Thomas. Women love the gays. And more importantly, they don't seem to mind that we don't give a flying fuck about them. What? It's like you and lesbians. They have what you want, but you're not allowed to have it. We're what women want and it makes them insane. Who can blame them? Smell me. How can anyone say no to this? I thrust my neck at him so he can properly appreciate how magical I smell. He wrinkles his nose. It's burning my eyes. The boy is a menace. He doesn't know what's good for him. What I'm saying, tomboy, is that the club is going to be full of lady girls, all horned up and nowhere to go. There might be other straight men there, I say. But you have a gay wingman. I give you my personal guarantee that you'll be swimming in tits by the end of the night. Now he starts cracking up, apparently for no reason. Maybe he's having a breakdown. Swimming, he gasps. A little too melodramatically, if you ask me. Take it easy there, Liza. You're not up for any Oscars. Like there's a pool full of disembodied tits. Is that how this works? An Olympic-sized pool full of tits, I say, trying to impress him with the scale of what I'm offering. But now he's just being dumb. Is that what you think straight men want, he asks, then goes all serious. <gasps> Wait a minute. You think you could pass for straight, don't you? Hell's damn, yes, I could pass for straight. Look, I'll do it right now. Dude, that's totally baller. I'm hella down for some beer pong. I'm gonna saddle up that poontang and ride it over the mountain Gangnam style with a tuba full of brewskis. And... All right, I have no idea what I'm saying anymore. My straight impression died a sudden death, but between you and me for the first two, maybe two and a half seconds, I shone like a star. It's uncanny, says Tom. I nod. Clearly I'm starting to get through to him. Aren't you getting ready, I ask? I am ready, he says. Can you believe it? He's lying there in his baggy running shorts and black tank top like he was raised by wolves. Though he does actually look okay in them in a perverse gangbanger slash frat boy kind of way. I swear with a bit of grooming and a nose hair trimmer, he'd clean up to a seven, maybe an eight with rounding. But I'm not gonna let this fly. I see what you're trying to do, I say. You're gonna make this hard for me. It's fine, I like a challenge. You could dress like a Soviet bag lady if you like. I'm still going to get you laid by the end of the night. We're the girl, right? Oh, right, if you insist. Honestly, I don't know if how you ever get laid if you're this picky all the time. Sometimes I don't even know where we're friends. I make you feel less like the crushing inevitabilities of life are bearing down upon you. Yeah, he's a real funny motherfucker. All right, then. Let's go. Thank you. Awesome. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's very strange. I can't hear anyone's reaction, so I'm just <laughs> dabbing into a void. And then we were on mute, but we were cheering for you. We, we were, were laughing. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Renee Roman, you are up next. Well, I am Renee Roman, and I live in upstate New York, and I've been writing for Bold Strokes Books a little over three years. And this is my latest that came out in June called Bonded Love. It's a contemporary romance between Master Carpenter, Blaze Carter, and emergency room nurse, Trinity Green. This scene begins shortly before they meet for the first time. She'd been restless for days. The tension from earlier began to build again, and she threw her hands up in defeat. Fuck it. Grabbing her keys, Blaze headed out. The minute she stepped on the porch, her shoulders relaxed. She trotted down the steps and turned for the garage. When she slid her leg over her bike, she sighed, then turned on the motor, embracing the motor that purred beneath her, her and brought it to life. Without a clear destination, Blaze was going to let the bike determine where she went, and she pulled on her helmet. A few miles later, she headed for her favorite diner. A piece of pie would make her feel better. She decelerated as she stopped for the intersection. The light turned green, and she eased open the throttle to make her turn. The screech of nearby brakes made her look over her shoulder, just in time to see the red muscle car almost on top of her. She gunned the motor to get out of the way but the grind of metal and the jarring impact felt like she'd run into a brick wall. 
The sky filled her vision as she fought to remember the collision rules she'd learned a long time ago. Something about going limp, rolling. Trees came too close before something snapped as she slammed into a tree trunk, then hit the ground. The air was stolen from her lungs before the darkness closed in. Through a murky haze, like being deep underwater, she felt discomfort in her chest. She tried to move away, but hands held her down. Hey, can you hear me? A male voice came from above her head. Blaze fought to focus. Her helmet was on, visor open. Yeah. It was hardly more than a whisper, and she tried again. Yes. What's your name? The EMT asked. Blaze. Blaze Carter. Blaze, you've been in an accident. We're going to transport you to the hospital now. Hang in there. She nodded, and a hot poker of pain shot down her neck and through her right arm. She held her breath until it passed. Her eyelids felt like lead. She fought against the meds, the discomfort, the pain, as the ambulance sirens blared. Okay, we're here. Machines were tossed onto the gurney with her, and the back doors flew open. What have we got here? Another voice. She gave in to the fatigue, knowing soon enough she'd be handled by a whole medical team. Damn, they were going to cut off her favorite leathers. A person in scrubs and a mask leaned over her. Blaze, I'm Dr. Rhonda Gaines. There's a lot going to be happening around you while we assess your injuries. The familiar voice from the ambulance spoke up. She was unconscious. Best estimate we have is less than five minutes. Witnesses say she was groaning shortly after she landed. Okay, CT of her head, chest, and abdomen. I want an MRI of that arm, with and without. Let's keep her sedated while we work. She was moving again. The lights, the voices, everything at once, and none of it made sense. As much as she didn't want to, Blaze gave in. She was too distraught to fight it. There was something in the words she'd heard that should have upset her, but she couldn't quite make sense of it. She drifted off, oblivious to the chaos around her. When Blaze began to surface from her drug-induced sleep, she hated not knowing how much time had passed and irritated by the rhythmic beeps too close to her ears. She tried to swat at whatever was poking her shoulder, but her arm was heavy and wouldn't move. When she tightened her bicep, pain shut up her neck, the cervical collar gone. Try not to move around, Miss Carter. She didn't recognize the soft, reassuring voice and pushed through the thick layer of cotton in her head. Her eyes opened to wavy auburn hair and expressive green eyes, the greenest she'd ever seen. The woman next to her was beautiful. Are you in pain? Only when I move. She tried to smile, but even a small movement stole what little comfort she'd been in. The woman came closer, placed an arm on her shoulder. I'm Trinity, one of the ED nurses. I'm going to give you something to help you relax. She didn't want more drugs and was about to protest. I know you don't want pain medication. The doctor ordered a sedative to take the edge off. The orthopedic surgeon will be in to talk with you soon. Surgeon? Why? Gaze diverted, Trinity avoided the question, and Blaze grew uneasy. I don't. I'm not the doctor. The curtain whipped back on its rail. Yay! <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that was quite a contrast. <laughs> <laughs> that was bonded love, yes. A little bit. That was bonded love. And so next up we have Anne Shade with the beautiful background there. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I will be reading from my upcoming release, Masquerade. It's a historical romance that takes place during the 1920s Harlem Renaissance in New York. Um, and it's between uh, Dinah Hampton, who's a nurse by day and a nightclub dancer by night, and Celine Montre, who is a hat and clothing designer. 
Um, the scene is taking place during their first meeting. They don't know who each other is. Um, so it's, it's a nice mystery for them. Celine spent the first hour of the party at a corner table nursing a glass of wine and wondering when she would be able to make an escape. Her aunt had been right. This was much different than the masquerade she went to in New Orleans. She thought she could handle it, that taking a new name would make her braver, but she was wrong. Most of the guests were in drag with men in some of the finest gowns she had ever seen and women dressed in elegant tuxedos with tails and carrying walking sticks. But there were those that chose to display their uninhibited side by barely wearing any clothes at all. One very shapely woman wore a sheer gown that left little to the imagination, while another wore a similar one that had well-placed well patches of leaves in revealing areas. It wasn't just the provocative clothing that had Celine's senses in overdrive. The large, formerly private mansion turned social club was dimly lit with low lights and scented candles that left her more lightheaded than the wine. Each of the four main rooms was decorated in an exotic theme focusing on Asia, India, Africa, and a French boudoir. It was an environment that beckoned hedonism and wild abandon, neither of which her culture sensibilities was used to. She sat in the African theme ballroom watching everything from her little corner table in the back of the room, too afraid of getting up to venture out and join the other revelers. She almost jumped out of her seat when someone sat beside her before she realized it was her aunt. Too much for you, her aunt asked. Celine looked around the room nervously. It's a bit overwhelming. What happened to the bold Camille? Celine gazed down at her glass of wine in embarrassment. Camille seems to have completely abandoned me. I see. Well, you are more than welcome to retire to a room upstairs if you had your fill. Are you sure? After all my talk, I feel like such a coward. Her aunt waved her hand dismissively. Nonsense. You lasted longer than most newbies. Thank you, auntie. Just as Celine stood to leave, the lights in the room dimmed and music from the tuxedo-clad female jazz band changed from a swing beat to a subtle jungle drum beat. It's too bad you're going to miss the entertainment. An excited murmur traveled through the crowd as a spotlight shone just past Celine and her aunt. It seemed every person in the room turned in Celine's direction, gazing at something behind her. She turned to see what everyone was looking at, a pathway cleared with a cloaked figure of a woman entering the room from a nearby doorway. Celine watched as the figure drew closer and found herself mesmerized by how the woman seemed to float instead of walk in the room. She halted just as she passed Celine and gazed back over her shoulder. Celine's breath caught in her throat as she saw the sparkle of deep brown eyes peering, peering at her through a feathered mask, the very mask her aunt had asked her to make. She gazed down at the front of the cloak knowing what lay beneath the matching top and bottom of the feathered costume. She found herself wanting to rip open the cloak to see the body of the woman who wore it. Her imagination had run wild wondering what this woman looked like, causing her to prick herself several times, literally leaving blood, sweat, and tears in that costume. When she looked back up, the woman smiled seductively and turned away and continued her spotlighted, slow, sexy stroll to the center of the room. She's known as Sable, Celine's aunt whispered in her ear. We should move closer to get a better look. Celine didn't argue. She just let her aunt guide her through the crowd until they somehow ended up in front. The rhythmic drumming that had been playing during Sable's entrance stopped as she slowly shed her long cloak to the delight of her audience, but no one was more affected by her appearance than Celine. Sable's long, lithe, muscular dancer's body and dark pecan complexion shone iridescently in the light. The way the leather of the feathered brassiere and shorts cupped her breast and behind so perfectly had Celine flushed with heat. Suddenly, a lonely trumpet wail filled the now hushed room and Sable began a slow, graceful dance in response. The rhythmic drums joined in once again and her movements grew wilder, more seductive as her body gyrated and swayed in a provocative dance that left every man and woman in the room heated with desire. At the height of her dance, she turned directly towards Celine. The trumpet stopped, leaving only the drum's cadence in its wake as Sable reached her arms towards Celine, beckoning her forward. Celine had been watching the performance awestruck. Even with masks covering most of her face, Sable's dark exotic beauty could not be denied. Now it was calling to her like a siren song. The drum beat picked up and Sable closed her eyes, wrapped her arms around herself, swaying to the beat and looked back at Celine and beckoned her once again. A memory niggled at Celine's mind, but before she could grasp it, something gently pushed her forward. With her gaze locked onto Sable, she continued moving forward. Celine stood center stage, gazing up at Sable, who stood a few inches taller than her. She was lost in the depths of Sable's eyes, no longer caring where she was or who was watching. 
All Celine knew was that she had to be near the seductress who had woven a spell around her that she couldn't deny or want to break. Sable moved close enough for their bodies to touch. There was almost, there was nothing but a thin strip of air keeping them apart. Celine trembled as she felt Sable's hands travel up the front of her tuxedo jacket. Something in the back of Celine's mind told her this was wrong. This was not how a lady behaved. But she thought, but the thought was quickly shoved aside by something more primal. A physical hunger that she had denied herself for far too long. That hunger became a need and refused to be denied, especially when this beautiful temptation sliding her warm hands beneath her jacket and up her back. When Celine reached up to touch Sable, she was left grasping air as the other woman quickly slipped away. Sable, mischievous, Sable smiled mischievously as the trumpet joined the drums again, and she began another dance, no longer able to control her desire, in one fluid motion as the drum beat in a steady cadence that seemed to match her heartbeat. Celine walked over, pulled up Sable, grasped the back of her head, and brought her lips down onto hers. In a kiss that left them both stunned at her own boldness and drew an excited applause from their audience. We should probably give them a bow, Sable said breathlessly when their kiss ended. Yay. Oh, that's awesome. awesome that's awesome. exactly how ladies should behave. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Masquerade, right? Yes. And that's available um, in February 2021. You're a tease, aren't you, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what you have out now. You have... Um, um, I currently have out Femme Tales, um, modern, three modern day fairy tale trilogies woven together um, to kind of create one story, but with three different little parts. Excellent. All right. Okay. So let's see here. Um, Kathy Knowles, you're up next. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Carson. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to be here. Um, my name is Kathleen Knowles, and um, I have written for Bold Strokes since 2012. That was when my first book was published. Today, I'm going to read from this book. It's called Trade Secrets, and uh, it concerns a, a couple of people who are associated with a, a startup company in Silicon Valley that bears an unmistakable resemblance to Theranos. And, uh, the uh, CEO of the company in my book is modeled after the um, uh, uh, after the CEO uh, of Theranos, which is Elizabeth Holmes. If you don't know this up, just Google it. And uh, uh, the uh, two characters um, will uh, actually have their second meeting in this scene. Uh, one, well, I'll explain to you what they are, but they're one's a venture capitalist and one works for the company. So it's about... Uh, they're falling in love. It's a contemporary romance in the midst of this crazy startup company that turns into something else that no one was really uh, expecting. So uh, my lab person is, is it's, uh, her point of view and she's at work. She was nearly ready to go into the lab when Abe appeared beside her. Hi, Tony. Good morning. Some of us are headed into town for coffee. Do you want to come? Tony hesitated, then decided to go. Why not? She wasn't the most gregarious person and tended to be shy around unfamiliar people. But she knew from experience that the only way to counteract that tendency was to get to know her co-workers. She'd had to learn that when she was in her 20s. Going out for coffee was a good idea. She bit back an automatic response of, no, I have to work. Okay, sure. They carpooled from the GHS campus in downtown Palo Alto. Tony liked the suburban vibe there, different from San Francisco's urban intensity. They arrived at Koopa Cafe, the in-cafe joint of Silicon Valley. Tony was told on the ride over. Tony did like coffee, and though the brew at work was okay, better than the usual workplace fare because it was actually drinkable, she was always up for a good cup of Cafe Joe. Besides Abe, a member of the chemistry group who was working on different assays and an engineer were there. The GHS structure was odd. All the functional groups had leaders who reported to Erica. The company had no research director and very few people in middle management. They waited in line and admired the cases of baked goods, chattering amiably. 
Tony had made her choice upon the recommendation of Lara from the chemistry group and happened to look back to the end of the ever lengthening line. There, staring at her cell, was the woman she'd met in the upstairs bathroom last week. A shock of excitement rattled her, immediately followed by fear. She had a choice. She could do nothing but wait and see if the woman noticed her, or she could walk up to her and say hello. She turned to Lara. I'll be right back. Save my place, please. It didn't pay to think about this type of thing too hard because she could easily come up with reasons not to make a move. She felt as though an invisible hand was pushing her. Hi, remember me? The woman raised her eyes, clearly startled, but as she apparently recognized Tony, she broke into a smile of pleasure. She wore another simple tailored pantsuit, black this time with a white shirt, and Tony swallowed, her, her throat tight with apprehension, though her unusual bravery thrilled her. My gosh, sure, you're Antoinette from GHS. We met last week in the restroom. She laughed. Tony decided not to correct her use of Antoinette. Maybe later, if there was a later. She remembers me. Wow. Yeah, I wanted to say hello. I'm here with my coworkers. She gestured vaguely to the people farther along in line. Great. This is a terrific place. We have business meetings here sometimes. How's it going with your new job? Oh, it's going well. You know, when you're new. Now that Tony was actually here talking to the unknown woman, all her bravado drained away and she was slipping into inarticulateness, not going to make a good impression. I do. I am Sheila Garrison, by the way. I never introduced myself. She stuck her hand, stuck out her hand and Tony took it. Her palm was smooth and dry and Sheila didn't let go of her hand immediately, which further unnerved and pleased Tony. Uh, good to meet you again. Um, how is the um, investing? Oh, Sheila laughed. Tony and her question seemed to amuse her. It's fine. We made a preliminary offer to your boss and are talking to her later this week. I think everything will work out. Fabulous, Tony said, and she bent it. Then she saw that Lara was almost at the cash register. I have to go, sorry. I understand. Perhaps I can call you sometime or you can call me. Tony could only mutter, yeah, okay, as Sheila scribbled something on the back of a card. Here's my cell. Work number is fine as well. Enjoy your coffee. Thanks. Tony managed to make eye contact with Sheila before she turned and sprinted to the cash register just in time. I got you that almond croissant, right? Was that what you were, who was that you were talking to? Lara asked as the group settled at a table. Oh, her name is Sheila Garrison. She's a VC and they're probably going to invest in us. I met her by accident last week up in carpet land. The technical people made a distinction between linoleum land, their domain, and the upstairs offices where the business people resided, carpet land. Does Erica know you know her? Gordon from engineering apparently had heard them talking and asked with an edge to his question that Tony wondered about. Gordon was both older in age and in longevity with GHS than the others present. He was a bit gruff and standoffish, but he was kind and generous to his colleagues. Tony was surprised he'd even come along on an outing like this because he was far senior to everyone, including Abe, who'd been in his job for only six months. I don't know her. We just met for the second time. Why do you ask? Gordon paused, looked at Abe, and something nonverbal passed between them. Gordon said, Erica doesn't like for different parts of the operation to know the other parts very well. She likes to have all the information and us peons to have little or none. Sheila's not even part of the company. Why should it matter if we know each other? Tony was mildly irked but intrigued. There was too much to learn when you were new to a company. It's probably fine. Erica is, well, eccentric in case you haven't noticed. Gordon shrugged. Case closed. I don't know. Maybe she is eccentric, but that's not important. In reality, Tony was hugely enamored of Erica, though only in an intellectual sense. She was, after all, a young woman who'd started her own company. That was monumental. Gordon was likely still rather sexist. With some men, especially older ones, that attitude never seemed to go away. Thank you. Awesome. That was great. I've, that whole story is very intriguing to me, so I can't wait to read this. Um, and that's an August release, right? Yep. Can you hold up the... There you go. Trade secrets, everyone. everyone. Awesome sauce. So next we have 
Jessica Webb. Jessica L. Webb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that L is super important to distinguish me from the other Jessica Webb. Right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica L. Webb. Um, I'm a Canadian author, Bold Strokes author. Uh, I live outside of Toronto. Uh, I write mystery, mystery romance, thriller romance. Um, I'll be reading from Stormlines, which is my July release. Um, so Stormlines starts with Devon, who's a burnt out psychologist off on stress leave, who finds Marley, a cop, uh, injured in an alley. So Devon has been visiting Marley in the hospital, and she learns that Marley is a cop who's not very good at following the rules. And in her, Marley's most recent case, um, she's part of an uh, arrest of a local drug kingpin, Randolph. And the rules that Marley is breaking is she is basically sheltering in secret um, Randolph's daughter, young daughter, Amy, as well as Randolph's mother, Carla. Um, so she's not been told she's not allowed to be doing this, but she is sheltering both Amy and Carla after Randolph's arrest. So this scene is Devin visiting Marley in the hospital. Um, and Devin has recently overheard a conversation between Marley and her supervisor. Devin walked into the hospital room with two takeout cups. Marley lay half reclined in the hospital bed, her eyes closed. Devin hesitated, not wanting to wake her. I smell coffee, Marley said, opening her eyes. Devin smiled as she walked to the bed and handed Marley a cup. You look tired, Devin said. Marley took the lid off her cup and blew ripples onto the top of her tea. It's been a big morning, Marley said. A walk to the nurse's station and visitors. General consciousness, Devin said, smiling. Lying is also very tiring, Devin added gently. Marley didn't seem to flinch away from Devin's words. It wasn't an accusation, more a gentle surfacing of fact, a calm acknowledgement. I need your help, Marley said. Devin listened and sipped her coffee as Marley began her confession. She'd been in this position many times before, and she was comfortable slipping into this familiar role. Marley continued to amaze her. She was obviously exhausted from her morning, but the self-doubt of her actions and decisions was painted across her expression in her voice. Marley was worried about these two secret dependents. It happened too fast, Marley was saying, running the edge of the white hospital blanket through her fingers. Carla is an amazing woman. She's so strong and capable, but she'd only met Amy for the first time about six months ago. Then she hears nothing from her son, Randolph. Nothing until a social worker calls in the middle of the night, saying she needs to get to Hamilton as soon as possible. Family and Children's Services wanted her to become Amy's guardian. I mean, it took two days of paperwork. They put Amy in foster home for the first night because Carla had to travel down from Thunder Bay. Devin gave a low whistle. That's a hike. What's that, 15 hours of driving? Yeah, and she did half of it by bus, Marley said. She's dedicated to that kid, I know she is, but she doesn't have a lot of resources, and she's scared of her son. Devin heard anger and frustration mixed with worry in Marley's voice. This was a woman who wanted to do right, always. And you tried to convince people to keep her in police protection. Marley nodded. All the intake workers saw was a good fit for Amy with Carla. I know their caseloads are huge, and a loving grandmother doesn't always magically show up for kids. I get that it seemed to everyone like a perfect fit but not to you, Devin said. No, Marley said darkly. They didn't listen, not to Carla's fear about Randolph West or his reach up into the Northern communities. When I tried to talk to the officer in charge, he said West was in jail. How much damage could he do? The question hung in the air between them, the sounds of the hospital playing out in the background. Tell me about Amy. Marley's eyes lit up. She's smart and funny when she gets to know you and opens up a little. She doesn't talk at all. We're still not sure if she can't or won't. She was medically cleared by a doctor when she was brought into custody. The doc suspects selective mutism, possibly caused by trauma. They handed Carla recommendations for counseling and some vitamins and sent them on their way. Devin watched the anger play out on Marley's features, a tightening of her lips, a narrowing of her eyes as she stared into her hands, as if she was constantly fighting a battle to right wrongs. Devin fought her instinct for only a minute before she spoke. How can I help? Red flag words, Ash, her therapist, had called them, an indicator that circumstances had brought her to the edge of a cliff. You need to know your limits before you ask, Devin recalled Ash saying. Right now, she felt a little reckless, using those words sitting in a hospital room with a cop who broke rules to help. But Devin's gut told her to be part of that help, 
to be part of whatever Marley was struggling with right now. Red flag words be damned. Groceries, Marley said. She tucked her dirty blonde hair behind her ear and shifted to sit up straighter, wincing. Carla's worried about Amy being recognized by Randolph's guys, so they mostly stay inside. I've got them in the East End because it's out of Randolph's known territory. But the Hammer's a small town city, really. So outside of Randolph's territory, but somewhere you aren't supposed to be, somewhere they'd be safest and you'd be at the most risk. Marley looked a little sheepish. I maybe hadn't thought that part all the way through. Devin laughed, wondering how often those words were true for Marley. She also wondered how much she wanted to stick around to find out. So the stabbing had nothing to do with the case. No, Marley said firmly, that was bad luck. Or bad planning. Devin looked into Marley's earnest, repentant, worried eyes. Tell me what you need me to do. That is Stormlines. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Lots of, lots of comments from people who've already read it in the chat there, so. Lovely. Thank you. Buy the book. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the chat roll is the information about our sale. Um, next up, we have Melissa Braden. And she's our last author to read today. So it better be good, Melissa, because you're bringing us home. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, as Carson said, I'm, I'm Melissa Braden. I write contemporary romance. And tonight I will be reading from Entangled, which is book one in the Tangle Valley romances. And essentially it's the story of Joey and Becca. And Joey has just inherited her family's vineyard, which she's lived and worked on her entire life. But at the same time, something awful has happened. Uh, a monstrous chain hotel has gone up down the road, and she is confident that it is going to kill the rustic, charming vibe of the vineyard. And so she's very angry about it, but she just can't seem to hate the hotel's manager, Becca, as much as she would like. And so this scene is their first time socializing together um, out on the town, kind of getting to know each other more. Two amazing brown cows with two scoops and added chocolate sauce, their server said, and placed a curvy glass in front of each of them. Oh, hello, sexy, Becca said, examining the magnificent drink. Joey winked. You're welcome. You were not kidding about this place. Becca dug in and then gestured to her dish with a spoon, dropping to a whisper to say, Maraschino's is importing crack-laced ice cream into their shop. Joey whispered back. No, they just make it fresh every day. They ate and chatted until they were ready to burst, but Joey wasn't quite ready to say goodnight. Becca sat back. He led me across the dance floor two steps at a time, introduced me to illegal homemade vanilla ice cream. I don't know how we're going to top this. Well, you can take a walk with me, Joey said. It'll stop me from curling into a sugar coma if I can burn off some energy. All right, Becca said, but only for coma dodging purposes. And you'll owe me. I'm like the godfather. Free glass of Pinot the next time you visit the winery? Sold. Becca smiled and her eyes crinkled at the sides. That was a great look. All of Becca's were. Joey hadn't known herself to have a type, but if she did, it would look exactly like Becca Crawford. Uh, when will that be? You visiting again, Joey asked as they exited the restaurant. They headed down the sidewalk where there was in a less than crowded part of town, which afforded them the space to walk beneath the streetlights all on their own. You already can't wait to see me. I must be doing okay. Well, Joey said, you definitely receive an A for the human factor, but the hotel employment skews your average. She shoved her hands into her pockets and kept her gaze ahead. It was easier that way. I'm going to focus on the A, Becca said. You also get one, but skewed for the judgmental factor. <gasps> Gasp out loud, Joey said. I am not judgmental. Oh, well, what about your sharp criticism and rush to conviction regarding the Jade Hotel? Joey scoffed. I would hardly call it rush, Becca countered. Well, the fact of the matter is you don't know the effect the resort's going to have on Whisperwall or on Tangle Valley. You're up in arms and it's all for nothing, trust me. I think you're going to be surprised. I'm actually expecting a fruit basket. Oh, well, you're ambitious and also a little delusional. Am I delusional in thinking that there's something happening between us? Joey gave her head the smallest of shakes. I wasn't expecting you to just 
go there. Shouldn't we warm up? Then you forgot the ambitious part. Neither said anything for a moment. They walked the quiet section of the street, listening to the buzz of the streetlights overhead as Joey tried to decide whether to punt the ball or go for it. Of course, there's something happening, she said, as if it were the most casual thing in the world, when the truth was that her heart was impersonating a jackhammer. And there was nothing every day about the bursts of excitement she experienced when Becca was around that, to be honest, she could really use in her life. With a hand on her arm, Becca turned her so that they were facing each other beneath the shadowy awning of a closed boutique. Joey was all she said. It was all she needed to say. The look in Becca's eyes communicated the rest. Joey felt the word all over, her name on Becca's lips. She took one step forward, eliminating the already small distance between them. It was her way of meeting Becca halfway and hopefully showing her that Becca's lips captured hers before she could complete the thought. Everything else went still, like the universe had a pause button for everything but this kiss, which sweet Moscato was better than any kiss should have the power to be. Her lips moved over Becca's and she savored not only their contact, but the chain reaction it sent through her body. Everything warmed, her fingertips tingled, her stomach flip-flopped, and her body craved. She cradled Becca's face in her hands as they kissed, slow, measured, and wonderful in the shadows. A shadowy kiss. That's how she would always remember it. Becca tasted sweet like the chocolate sauce. She'd always remember that too. And then, so very sadly, it was over. Joey's eyes were still closed, however. She needed them to be so she could cling to it for just a few seconds longer. When she opened them again, the world was still waiting for her, and so was Becca. I just took the liberty, Becca said. Joey touched her lips. Is that what they call it? Whatever it was, she shook her head and offered Becca a smile. We might be mortal enemies, but we sure can kiss like we were meant to kiss. Joey exhaled and met Becca's gaze in the dim light. Yeah, what you just said. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet Moscato. Sweet Moscato. <laughs> that was a great scene. That was a great yeah. scene. Mm -hmm. So hold that book up again one more time. Oh, yeah, this is Entangled. It's book one in a three-book series. Three best friends, each of their own romances. And wine. And wine. <laughs> all you want. <laughs> all right, I'm getting lots of good comments for all of your readings. Some people have discovered new authors, which is awesome. And um, let's take a question here. We've got a question from Anne Hart. I would find it terrifying, terrifying to read something I wrote in public. How do you prepare to do a reading? Melissa. Well, I, I think for me, I, I try to pick something that's usually in the first uh, 100 pages of the books or, or so that gives a taste as to where we're going. But usually I look for something that's um, fun or flirty or indicates the conflict. And I'll pick a beginning and end point and then just make sure it sounds good out loud and uh, practice it a few times. Practice really does help. I thought you were going to say sweet Moscato. That's the only way I get through a reading is with a <laughs> little bit of such courage at the start. That I think, that's, I think that's very, very valid, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So practice and sweet Moscato. Jessica, anything else? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, well, we're very lucky at Bold Strokes because Melissa has given talks about how to prepare for a reading and how to do a reading, and that's been really helpful. I think Anne is agreeing with this. Um, practice makes a huge difference, even though I know my work inside and out because you know I wrote it and then edited it 70 trillion times um, it's different when you are reading it to an audience um, I also mark up if you really don't like people writing in books just close your eyes for a moment I mark up my books and I write notes and I cross things out um, because if it doesn't add to the reading in the moment even if it adds to the story overall um, I just want a really succinct scene that people can get things. Okay. See, Melissa does it too. So if Melissa Braden does it, then it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> well, and shade, obviously a good background helps. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. Well, once again, taking Melissa's class. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I think it's important to pick a scene that kind of teases, but doesn't give enough away that, you know, that they won't buy the book because they already know what's going to happen. Um, but I also record myself reading just to kind of feel more comfortable reading in front of people because I can, I tend to talk fast sometimes. So if I'm reading fast, it's just, it doesn't help with the aspect of the reading. So I, I listen to myself, I watch myself and kind of, you know, record it and make sure that I'm doing it the right way. Awesome. Kathleen, Even though I hate the sound of my voice. <laughs> we all do hate the sound of our voices, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, any tips for for getting up the gumption to do a public reading? Um, everybody said pretty much all, all already. Um, I I had the advantage of having part of my job for years was talking at times in groups of people, so I wasn't um, paralyzed by it. Um, but it really it really helps to to practice it aloud to someone. And, and um, the first time I tried reading uh, in a reading s setting, uh, I was, it was terrible um, for a lot of reasons. But one thing I learned from a lot of listening to a lot of people was just to try to be animated, you know, and try to put some feeling into it. And we get lots of tips at Bold Strokes, including, you know, classes like, like Melissa's. And, and anytime we're reading, um, we were reminded of the things you're supposed to do, like mark the mark it up, you know, edit it, practice it, et cetera. Practice makes the, the best, um, it's best at reducing the stress. Definitely. Thank you. Renee, how about you? Anything I am terrified time? every single time. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I've read it 40 times, 100 times, and I probably have between writing it and edits. Um, yeah, nerves just get the best of me until I'm through that first page, and then I tend to find my rhythm, and then I'm okay. But that first is like, God, you just said nothing that's on that page. But <laughs> yeah, no one knows but me, so no. you know, <laughs> I'm the only one who's in panic mode at that point. So it's okay. I'll get better. Y'all no, are all great. So we have one more question, and we have a few few minutes to answer this. So, how do you get inspiration for your characters? And Kathleen, Kathleen, I'm going to go to you first because you did pick a character, at least a real life person. But um, but but how did you populate that world with fictional folks? Um, yes, right. I I, I tend to to look at um, real people because I write historical stuff as well. Um, so I look at, at uh, sometimes at, at real real people, but the, the inspiration for characters comes from all, all of the stuff I read. I read a lot of, of um, LGBT culture and, and uh, or else I've met somebody. Um, I, I met somebody a long time ago who was a falconer and now I want to write a book one of the characters is a falconer and and uh um reading news articles reading um it, that's usually where i i get my inspiration and and for this one i had the, the real character the ceo of the company the two um uh main characters are completely fictionalized but i just thought myself i thought to myself well what if a venture capitalist and a lab person a lab scientist met what would that be like and what would happen if they were inside this crazy company what what was that like i read the book a lot of books uh and newspaper articles about the company as well so then i just uh took it from there awesome my fictional people <laughs> Renee, how about you? Where do you get inspired to inspiration for characters? Um, I guess I, I always start with um, a general idea of, well, what profession would be realistic and interesting to cross another um, and how would that happen? Another profession. So a master carpenter has an accident. She meets a nurse. Um, those are kind of the things um, in stroke of fate. It was a writer who was threatened and the bodyguard she hires to protect her. So it's those kinds of things and the names 
I say hundreds of names until they fit. First name first, and then I figure out their last names. But I tend to upset some people because my names tend to end with an S. <laughs> yeah, there's the dreaded apostrophes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm well acquainted with that malady. Um, <laughs> Sinjin, how about you? Oh, you have stealing. a lot of fun <laughs> characters in your book. <laughs> stealing from real life, a lot of those people are uh, people I know or just amalgamations of qualities of people. Um, for example, one of the characters in Quake City, uh, I, I was dating someone and he received a commission to design a costume for an Instagram famous monkey. The monkey has, I looked him up, the monkey has 1 million followers on Instagram and like, fuck my life. That's more people who, than are ever going to read my book as they're following this monkey, just watching him eat bananas and living the life of Riley with custom made robes. And uh, the, the guy I was dating was not too thrilled about it either. Um, but, you know, I, I, he told me the story and I thought, oh, I'm having that. That's too good. I can't leave that on the table. No. You, you can't make that stuff up. You just, that's a gift. <laughs> Jessica, how about you? Uh, mine are also, I think, amalgamation of news and probably people I know that might stress out the people I know who are listening right now. Um, a lot of it is just a, an idea, either about a person or a plot, and then it just kind of goes from there. So for Stormlines, uh, I really wanted to write a character who was not directly involved in a mystery, didn't know about crime, didn't know about, um, you know, solving crimes and, and gathering evidence and that kind of thing. I like that interplay of characters. Um, and also, I definitely imbue my characters with some of the my own shit that I'm trying to work out, and I work it out through them, I'm not going to lie. So feel free to guess what, you know, shit I'm working out through each of my characters. Send me a message and just guess. I may or may not tell you if you're right. Um, but yeah, they just sort of become their own people as I figure out who they are. But a lot of it is just pulling in bits of who they are as a character, but other people I know, just things that I've heard, maybe not as, as interesting as, you know, designer monkey dresses, but <laughs> just things that I've heard all, all come into a character. So it's hard to top designer monkey dresses. <laughs> it is. I mean, we, I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how about you? Where do you get your inspiration? Um, my characters come to me in dreams. Um, mm -hmm. The weirdest thing. Uh, so I do a lot of writing at 5 a.m. because I wake up from something and have to run to my computer and write stuff down. Uh, so literally every character I've come up with has come to me in a dream. I think I'm maybe I'm a little, just a little schizo, but. <laughs> oh, not at all. That means your brain's working hard <laughs> over time. You probably need a nap after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Melissa, how about you? You have a lot of books with friends in them and yeah. I love that. So. I wish it would come to me in dreams. I. <laughs> Angry, damn it. My dreams are letting me down. You can have it. <laughs> I see that in my life. Um, I think it's different every time, honestly, the way that it comes to me. Sometimes it has to do with what's going to serve a certain occupation, what, what qualities or, or character traits are going to work for a big conflict point. I think more often than not, it has to do with the chemistry of the two main characters when, I, when, I'm, when I'm creating, like, what two uh, ingredients are going to cr snap crap crackle and pop the most. Um, and so you try a few things on and you see where that tension lies. And if it's not quite there, then you kind of up the quotient of one of their, their character traits. And then suddenly they're driving the other one nuts in a really good hot way. So <laughs> awesome. Great answers, all of you and th great readings. Thanks very much for sharing your work with us. Remember, um, head to bullstrokesbooks.com and take advantage of the great sales. Um, the August books are available now, even though it's only July, because we believe in time travel. <laughs> and <laughs> make sure to tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, we'll have Pamela Stewart giving our keynote, and then a full slate of events the rest of the day and Sunday. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carson. Bye. Thanks, Carson. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks a lot. See you.